yeah, just a privilege to be able to be here. Uh, this is my first time in the Miami area and maybe the closest I've actually been to the actual Miami city. Um, but yeah, um, my wife, um, Kieran, um, stayed home this time. Um, we actually, I don't really do this kind of thing too often. Um, I'm uh, part of the international leadership for the organization called Ethnos 360. Maybe some of you heard of New Tribes Mission. That's the name it is called today. And um, yeah, we've been with the organization for over 20 years. Um, we're also associated with CMML, committed from an assembly in Ohio where I grew up, and then also Waterbury Christian Fellowship in Connecticut. So maybe some of you met Jack Spender. He's been down here um, before. Or maybe Oli Jacobson, um, I don't know if you recognize that name. Um, but he's from the Faroe Islands and also part of the same team that I'm on. Um, yeah, this is my, my family, and uh, we have three daughters. So it's really fun to see all the girls up here singing. It's amazing how quickly that time passes. Um, but yeah, three daughters, two of which are married, and um, the oldest just got married last year. And uh, our middle daughter got married the year before. Now we got a grandson. So, yeah, Rick and Evie are, um, yeah, for a good reason, um, excited about their grandchild. And, yeah, we, we love being a grandparents. So it's one of those things you really just don't quite get until you're, you're one. <laughs> um, yeah, for uh, Abraham's sake, I wasn't actually planning on really talking too much about our ministry, but... Um, I will show you just a few pictures. Um, yeah, it was um, really uh, uh, good to be able to be at the missions conference and talk a bit about and the story that God has allowed us to, to be a part of working among a, a small people group in Indonesia. And um, yeah, I, I noticed that uh, yeah, I'm associated with Vietnam and it's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, again, is my my role in the international leadership and uh, helping to facilitate really ministries um, worldwide. But one of the other countries is Vietnam. We just, my wife and I just returned from there uh, this past Sunday and um, we were there for about three weeks and God is doing amazing things in that still communist country. Mm -hmm. And the gospel is uh, reaching out to more people than uh, it ever has in history um, there. And, uh, so we're praying for more laborers to join in and the work of seeing it go out further and also for people to be discipled. If you can imagine um, a place that has been without the gospel for so many years, people come into Christ, but they're still babies, right? They don't have a, all this, maybe the um, history of, of um, biblical understanding that is passed on from generation to generation. Like we get to enjoy much of our context here in this part of the world. So there's a lot of need. Um, and the other connection to Vietnam is uh, my mother was Vietnamese. My, my dad was a Marine and met her during the war. And, uh, took her back to the States and they had me. And so I, I grew up um, here in the States, but it was a multicultural home. Um, and my dad later learned Vietnamese. So when they didn't want us kids to understand what they were talking about, they would switch to Vietnamese. I wish I knew it, honestly, but. Yeah, so yeah, but um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the place we had worked, and that was in Indonesia. So Indonesia is the world's largest archipelago, over 6,000 islands, 13,000 islands, actually 6,000 uninhabited islands in this island chain. It's pretty amazing. Um, we lived there for 17 years in this country. We learned Indonesian on the island of Java. Um, not too far from Jakarta, and then moved to where you see that kind of uh, drop pin. And that's um, Moy, Moy land. Uh, it's where this um, people group that was living in mountainous jungles there for centuries. Um, they weren't discovered until 1998 when missionary pilots uh, were flying over uh, the point x-ray, which is where three rivers converged and made a distinct X. And uh, this is one of the rivers you can see in this valley. And uh, yeah, they noticed that there's these little hamlets, uh, little, little grass roof 
houses um, scattered in the mountains and nobody really knew who they were. Um, the boy were seeing these planes fly over as well. They had no connection to the outside world. So they thought they were evil spirits because that's all they, they knew. And um, their, their lives were um, really difficult, uh, filled with fear, um, filled with violence. Uh, they had no knowledge of truth. They did not know the name of Christ, had never heard of Jesus. And hard to believe that there would be people like that in the world, but there's still many people like that in the world that maybe have heard the name of Jesus, have no idea who he is. More and more, it's that, that way here in the in this part of the world too. But um, the infant mortality rate among these people was 80% when we got there, meaning of every five children that were born, only only one would live to beyond age one. Um, there's different reasons for that. Sickness was really prevalent. Common things that we could treat like pneumonia and dysentery, they were dying from. They had to believe that if you get sick, you don't drink water because that'll, that'll make it worse. And so you can imagine that a lot of them are just dying from dehydration. So their lives were pretty horrible. I remember talking to some Italian guy on, on a plane as we were um, heading back, I think, to the States, maybe. Um, yeah, just on our regular home assignment, and we just got to talking, and he's like, why do you, like, why do you, why do you bother with them? Like, why don't you just leave them alone? They're, they're happy the way they are. <laughs> and I began to start telling them stories, stories that we had witnessed and seen, and some of the horrors that were connected to their way of life, and, and, um, he began to realize that, wow, oh, they're not happy the way they are. And, uh, it was an opportunity to share Christ with him as well. But, you know, you, if you read Romans chapter one and you see when people turn away from God and they, they head down this downward spiral, um, it gets from bad to worse. And here's a people group that from some generations ago, I believe, um, what was known of God was rejected, kind of like Cain had done, right? God was actually talking with Cain and pleading with him, and he turns away from God. Like that's that's what we do. Um, our, our hearts are pretty wicked, and um, pure wickedness, like unhindered for centuries. But God is uh, an amazing God. He he looks at these people and and he loves them. He knows each one by name and doesn't want them to continue on living and then dying and enter into crisis eternity. And so he um, allowed three families to, to first start to work in the year 2000, the Canadian family, American family, and then the Indonesian family. And uh, the Canadian family had to leave because a uh, wife came down with some significant health issues. So we were invited to join the work then in the year 2005. Um, and uh, at that point, um, our coworkers had already learned the Moy language. They had reduced this unwritten language into writing. That's part of what our training gives us the tools to be able to do that through phonetics, phonemics, linguistics. So, taking this unwritten language, creating an alphabet or an orthography, and from that alphabet, then you can start doing the most important, I think, one of the best jobs you could ever do in the world is, is translate God's word. Um, be able to, yeah, take his word and then put it in a language of a people that, like that's how they communicate their hearts, how they understand everything. And for the Moy, God had given them a language with the actual capacity to praise God, but it had never been used for that. And um, by his grace and the power of his word, he, he entered into this place of darkness and yeah, brought the truth, the, the light to them. And um, I'm skipping many details because this is not my main focus of the message this morning, but um, yeah, we were able to see um, eight believers. This is after five years of living with them, by the way, of treating them for sickness and loving on them and 
there was only eight people that wanted to hear the creators talk, even though many had been connected to the team along the way. And we had the most wonderful coworkers, loving people, selfless. And yet, you know, the Moy were just really blase about what we've come for, realizing or thinking that really the only reason we were there is because they were so awesome and we wanted something from them. So, but yeah, there was eight people who were willing to sit through some weeks of teaching. We started in the book of Genesis and we use these pictures to help them to understand the stories along the way. The reason we started in Genesis is because Genesis introduces God. In the beginning, God. Um, it's super important, and we've seen this to be a critical piece in how people can come to know and understand the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. But if we even say He is the Son of God, and we we believe that to be true, we have a lot of other understanding that had to be in place for us in our own minds to make sense of Jesus being the Son of God. And first and foremost is that there is a God. This God is a holy God and he loves mankind and he made mankind perfect and made him in his image. And, and that's why people are so special to him. But mankind has turned away from him and is needy and needs him. The Moy didn't feel like they needed anything. So super important that they needed to have a clear concept of who God is. And as you've heard along the way, I'm sure that people need to be lost first before they can be found. They didn't feel like they needed anything. But thank God through the teaching of his word and as we unfolded for them, how God is holy and perfect and, and he's communicated his standards to, to people and we have not met up to them. And uh, we fall short. And yet he continues to reach out and, and he's now had to step into history in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to make a way so that they could actually know him. But they needed to be lost first. And by God's grace, the eight people that heard this whole message that stuck around for him, some came and went, but ones that stayed the whole time for a few weeks um, all of them came to Christ. And uh, then uh, through their wonderful testimonies, um, a couple of years later, many more were wanting to hear. And so, yeah, a lot of them ended up getting saved. It was probably about another 30 or so that got saved with about a 70 that came to that teaching. Um, by the way, there was a lot of professions, but God's word says by their fruit, you'll know them. And I uh, started realizing that some of them were just in word or mouth only. But um, we had then uh, from these folks um, began to shift our focus from evangelism to discipleship. Um, we were translating more of scripture and wanting to take those new believers deeper to their understanding who they are in Christ. Um, we Realized it was just very much God's grace and almost really a, in many ways a miracle that we could be in this 85% um, of Indonesia's Muslim. So we're in the predominantly Muslim country with visas to do what we've come to do. And so, yeah, we were living among these people. The only way in and out is by helicopter initially and then small plane, working with them. But if somebody in Jakarta, for some reason, feel like, why are these guys getting visas? <laughs> and then make the decision they can't have visas anymore, and then we would be, what? We'd be stuck, and we would have to go back to the States. So we just felt like, who's, who's to know how long we could be here? We need to see disciples made. And of course, that's what the Great Commission is all about, to make disciples. It's not just to evangelize. And so, yeah, by God's grace, we were able to see that happen. We poured into it, guys, over about a year and a half's time. Um, they were able to stand at the next outreach and begin to teach as well. They, in fact, they, these eight guys taught 75% of the overall um, teaching from creation to Christ. And from that, there was about 80 people that got saved. So the church like 
tripled in size. And then it just continued to grow and grow from, from there. So we've been able to see by his grace, um, people raised up um, to be able to teach and, and take that responsibility. And, uh, yeah, it was 10 years from the time that we had our first believers to the time we had elders recognized. And there was times I was in my office working away on file translation and, you know, dreaming about what these guys could be, but seeing them like not really stepping up to the plate, not really having a heart of a shepherd, really focusing on their own needs is more important than the needs of others and crying, thinking, God, this is never going to happen. I remember this, this has been like from the very beginning, like a, a walk of faith and not by sight. You guys remind me again, Rich, hasn't it always been this way that you're supposed to just trust me and, and you're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, Lord, you're right. Forgive me. And then you just keep at it. And then he does the work. And so that happened 10 years later. By the way, it hasn't been like better roses since. It hasn't been. <laughs> or these are people, normal people. And issues have come, but by God's grace, things have continued. I just got a text message from one of the elders. Um, we have satellite inter internet in there, and we're partnered with a, a wonderful Christian school organization. There's more children there than, than it ever has been. So it's amazing what God has done among these people now. And uh, they're now reaching out to other parts of Boyland on their own, seeing the gospel go to people that have never heard. Some of these have still never seen white people. And then uh, some of them are, have even gone to other islands in Indonesia. And they've learned Indonesian and are getting trained as missionaries to do the same thing that we, we did. To go among other unreached people groups and take the gospel to them. So that's a little bit of a brief overview of, of what we've been privileged to be able to be a part of. In the year 2018, Karen and I returned with our three daughters to, as our oldest was graduating from high school, and we wanted to see our girls launch well. We felt uh, God had just put on our hearts to, to take the time so that they could do that. And yeah, by, God, by God's grace, you're all doing well and walking with him. And they want to serve the Lord. Um, our youngest is in missionary training right now. And the other two are with her husbands are wanting to serve the Lord in some way. So we'll see what path he has for them. But in the missions conference, um, uh, I, I mentioned this, uh, maybe I'll say it here too. Um, from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, and the point is no way to, um, to speak negative of the amazing things that God has done in this area among his people. Um, but my prayer is that there'll be others that might be raised up from here in the Miami area who would be willing to go overseas full time. Um, and I think it's been a while, maybe, since that has happened. Um, you know, uh, there's huge needs around us, and I know that any of us can look in our neighborhoods. We're living in Wisconsin right now. My dad is in poor health, and we're helping to care for him. So I work remotely and travel a lot. But um, you know, our neighbors, a lot of them don't know the Lord. There's a lot of work around us. But what I'm sharing with you, and I'm sharing with you about the Moy that's unique about their situation is say if they wanted to hear one day they woke up and they realized these spirits that we've been putting our faith and trust in all these years they're not giving any kind of answer to hope i want hope i want freedom from this bondage where would they turn who do they go to they, they can't even open up any scripture or hear truth from anybody and, you know, it, it took actually God sending some of his people to go bring the message to them. That was the only way they could hear. And, and what I'm representing here is not just a, a one-off kind of thing. It, it's, there's thousands of people groups still who have no opportunity to hear unless somebody goes and tells them. And um, so it's a huge 
burden on, on the Lord's heart. You looked at Revelation 5 9 this morning, I think it was Tim that had, we had looked at that together. And you know, it, it talks about there will be representatives from every single tribe, tongue, and people and nation there at the end. Um, and that's where it's all going. And that's exciting. But the reason that's going to happen is because people took the message to every single one of those people, those tribes, tongues, and people's nations. And so we need, we need people who are willing to do that. That's why Jesus is asking us, pray for laborers, pray for workers who go into the harvest, 